Let one. Thank you, Matt. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give me the Lord's house today. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Just say amen when you got it. All right, all right. Go. Right. I'm talking about. Good to be in the Lord's house today, amen. amen. I've got a uh, announcement. Uh, the drive-through nativity pageant at Dutch Bottoms Church, December 12th, Monday through December 17th, from 7 to 9 p.m. each night, located on 25 Highway 25E on the way to Morristown. You will be blessed. We encourage you to go by there. Enjoy it. Are you happy this morning? Amen. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. <laughs> Luke 5, chapter 5, verse 1 says this. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, in other words, the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Would you bow your heads this morning? Brother Charlie, would you take us to the Lord? Father, we're grateful for the day that you've given us, Lord, for the beauty of the day, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are the master of all things and still in control of all things, regardless of our situation. Lord, you know who would be here this morning, who wouldn't be here. We were asking for a fresh anointing, Lord, this morning, Lord, for a new touch, Lord, not dwelling on yesterday's blessing, but we're reaching forward to that which you would have us reach this morning. We're asking this blessed effort to those that are here this morning. We'll minister to those that are not for whatever reason, Lord, touch them where they're at. We'll give you the faith for all in Jesus' name. The church says, Amen. 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 Turn to somebody and tell them you're glad to see them here this morning. Amen. No doubt you've uh, probably seen it on Instagram, Facebook, and whatever other things are out there, but we want to recognize uh, one of our own this morning. Um, one of Greenville's finest now, Brother Derek, has graduated from Police Academy, and he starts on Monday. Yeah, go ahead and look at it. Look at it. <laughs> um, let me tell you something. God has done great things. And uh, God has allowed him to do this, and he has been a willing vessel for the Lord. And God will use him as an instrument of righteousness, and we just thank the Lord for that, don't we? Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to congratulate him for that. Uh, how many of you like to have control? Okay. I swear I, swear I heard a sonic boom as hands went up that time. Woo! <laughs> Uh, listen, we all like to have control of things. We like to be in control. We like to have control of things. And when things get out of control, we don't like it. We can't stand it. It bothers us a lot. And because of our infatuation with control, because we want to have control, we love to have control, unfortunately, we get out of God's will sometimes. Because... We, we, we forget or, or we come, become complacent with, with the, the knowledge that has been given to us that God has everything under control and that it's not in us to control things, but it's God and through God's wisdom alone. Now, that being said, we still get out of pocket sometimes. Uh, we still get out of hand sometimes. And, and it's hard to take our hands off of things and say, okay, God, you're in control. And, and to allow him to, 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 to keep things where he wants them rather than to try to mess with it and, and work our will in things. And I have a struggle with this, and, and many people do, and it's okay to struggle with this. We're human. But there, are, there is a path to recovery from this stuff. 
And, and if we stay and, 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 we, and we continually wrestle with controlling things and having to control things, we will always be miserable. How many of you have been miserable because you try to control it and realize you can't control it? Try to control uh, uh, health problems. Try to control financial situations. Try to control tempers. Try to control addictions. We've tried in and of ourselves for all of these things, and we've been worse off because we exhausted ourselves. And we're still suffering. But God, absolutely. But God gives us some steps to recovery, and in this passage we see this. Number one. Real simple, allow Jesus to take control. Now watch this. Verse number three that we read says, And he entered, Jesus, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, Simon Peter. Remember, we've got some fishermen here, Andrew, James, John, and Peter. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, in other words, Simon Peter's, and prayed him, in other words, told him that he would thrust that he would thrust out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Notice that nowhere in this verse did he ask Simon Peter's permission to get in his boat. The Bible just says he went over and got in the boat. Now, I don't know about you, but I get a little possessive of the things that I have. And when I'm in my house, and I haven't invited anybody over, and somebody comes to my door and then opens the door and comes in, there's a problem. How about you? There's a situation there. I don't want somebody just coming in, taking control, somebody coming in and, and just barging in my house like that because it's my house, it's my sanctuary, you know what I'm saying? There's a rule and there's a law on the books uh, that if a person, a, even a parent, uh, gets on a school bus, it doesn't matter if their child's on there or not. If they get on that school bus and you've asked them to leave, then they can be charged with every count of kidnapping for every kid on that bus. Mm -hmm. So when a parent comes up to the door, I always shut the door and say, come around to the window. Because it's going to be really hard for them to climb in that window. Hmm? <laughs> and we don't like people barging in. We don't like people just doing this thing. And we talk about this guy named Peter, and he was, he was brash. Yeah. He, he, he had his will. He had his way. He was one of those people that spoke first and then engaged his mind afterward. Do, any, do we know anybody like that? Don't point. Please don't point at people. Not even yourself. Don't point. <laughs> but he spoke first. It's whatever. Just spit it out there. Just got to get it out there. And, and, and he told people what he thought right then without thinking first. Jesus just got the boat. No doubt. Peter kind of looked over and was like, man, what is this guy doing? Now, Jesus had been talking to these people. Now, I want you to see what's going on here. Jesus had been talking to these people. There were crowds around him. So much so that he went down to the beach, and he was, he was walking along, and all these crowds were following him. And these guys were mending their nets. So uh, these fishermen, when they were fishing, the, the nets would get broken, and, and, and they would need to be mended and cleaned out and everything like that for all the sea life that would be caught in there. And so they were in it, and no doubt they were hearing Jesus. They were hearing what he was saying. They were hearing what he's talking about, much like we do on outreach. You know, we talk to the person in the store. We talk to the person behind the counter. But we always speak loud enough so anybody else that's in the store can hear us praying, can hear us talking about Jesus. Amen? Jesus was doing the same thing. He was allowing them to listen. And this guy had quite a following. And he just stepped in this boat without even asking permission. And then... He told him, he said, hey, pull away from the shore. And Peter did it. You know, that's something that's hard for us to comprehend, that when God tells us to do something, we just do it. How many of us are excuse makers? God tells us to do something, and we have a thousand excuses, even before the entire mission is given to us. Even with people, when somebody asks us to do it, we think of all these reasons why we can't. As a parent, I've been guilty of that. Before my daughter gets a full sentence out of her mouth, I'm already thinking of excuse. No, I don't want to. Mm -mm. And, and I'm guilty for that. But see, God isn't like that. God knows what we need. God knows what we want. And he tells Peter, he says, cast out. And Peter did it. The Bible says 
In Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You in yourself do not have the power to overcome yourself. Amen. But it takes Jesus in you that makes you humble enough to say, okay, God, I don't know what's best. You do. How many have struggled with that one before? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to think about this. What did Jesus get in? He got in Peter's boat. That boat represented his livelihood. That boat represented how he made his money, his entire investment in life. This is what Peter's life was surrounded around, this boat. And now somebody has come into his boat and is telling him what to do. I don't know about you, but that kind of irritates a little bit. You see, Jesus does that in our lives sometimes. We think we know what's best and we think we know what's going on. And Jesus comes in sometimes and he says, hey, listen, I want you to do this. Amen. And we bristle a lot of times. And we, we, get, we get a stiff neck and we say, no, I'm not doing that. I don't feel like it. I don't think that's the right way to do things. But we've got to remember that he is the potter and we are the clay. Amen. Come on. Yeah. And this is a struggle that we all go through. Don't think you're alone in it. And don't think this. I think we have a problem a lot of times thinking that God's irritated at us. Or maybe it's just me. But I offend God a lot of times by my attitude. I offend God a lot of times by when he tells me to do something, I don't do it because I've made excuses not to do it. And I want you to know this morning that we serve a loving and a righteous God. And he is not mad at you. He is not irritated at you. He's not holding anything against you. He loves you. And the only reason he got in the boat was because he wanted to minister, not just to the crowd, but to Simon Peter. He took somebody that was brash and harsh and offended everybody he was around. He took somebody like that and he said, oh man, what potential this guy has. Come on, talk to me today. Amen. He looked at somebody like me and he looks at somebody like you and he doesn't see us for our negatives, but he sees us for our positives. Amen. He sees us for what he made us for, not our mistakes in the past. He says, this is my child. This is somebody I love. Amen. I was listening to a preacher this morning. He said, you know what? God came down before Jesus healed any blind eyes. Before he caused the lame to walk, the dumb to hear, the, I'm sorry, the deaf to hear, or the dumb to speak, before he did anything like that or raised the dead, God came down and he was baptized and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. God looks at us and he is well pleased with us because of our potential in him. But not because, but, but we postpone all of the good things that God wants to do in our lives by being self-willed and headstrong. Come on, talk to me this morning. Amen. How many have battled with this for years? Amen. My hands up. Amen. Getting myself out of the way and saying, God, I need you to take over. Because I've made a mess of this life. I've made bad decisions. I've done wrong things. And what God wants to do is he doesn't just want to preach to me from the shore. He wants to come right in the middle of my income. He wants to come right in the middle of my livelihood. Right in the middle of my life and say, this is the way we need to go. Now cast out. Get, get an amen. amen. We have to be willing to obey the living God. Amen. And that's hard to do. It's difficult to do. The Bible says in Luke 14 and 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So I'm talking to those of you and myself today that have a problem forsaking all that we have. <laughs> I've said it before and I'll say it again. We treat God's word a lot of times like a buffet. And I go to the buffet, and I don't like the lima beans, so I don't get the lima beans. But I do like the shrimp, so I do get the shrimp. And I don't much care for the rice, but I do love the fried chicken. Talk to me this morning. I'm making you hungry. I better hurry and finish this sermon. Amen. 
you understand that we pick and choose what we like out of God's word. And God says, no, I want to be in the middle of everything. I want your entire life, your entire priorities. I'm about to get on tonight, sir. Your entire priorities to be centered around me. Because I gave my life for you. Amen. Right. And that's hard to do. But the Bible says, as I just read, that if we don't forsake everything, hey, that's hard to do. Because we can, a lot of times, we can forsake an attitude about a certain thing. But we don't forsake our anger. Or we can forsake an old lifestyle going to the old places. But we don't forsake old habits. Talk to me. Amen. We can forsake... Uh, oh, hear me. We can forsake going to those old places, but we don't forsake old friends. Amen. And we know that they're not headed down the right path and they're bringing us with them. Amen. Oh, my. Uh, go ahead. Give the, give the Lord a hand. Clap praise. That's, that's what he does. You see, God wants everything. And I mean, here's the definition of everything. Everything. That's pretty much it. There's no secret to this. It's all of it. How many of us have kept something back from the Lord? Have kept just a little something back? Just a little bit of our past, you know, that still bothers us, or we're still keeping that back. We haven't given that to God. As somebody that's done us wrong, we're kind of keeping that back because one day. Hey, let me tell you something. In my wallet right now, I have the card of Staff Sergeant Stephen Tyler. Not of Aerosmith. Stephen Tyler. <laughs> and I keep that card because it reminds me of forgiveness. Because that recruiter lied to me. He lied and lied and lied to me. We walked in. 19, 18, 19 years old, we walked into that recruiter's office, me and my buddy, and we said, yeah, we want to sign up. What do you guys want to do? And we saw big posters of repelling and, and going airborne and, and doing all these things, helicopters and, and tanks and stuff. But we want to do that. All right, sign right here. Liar! <laughs> you lied to me. And I kept that card for the longest time. I'll find this guy. He lied to me. He lied and lied. And that card used to represent something I didn't give the Lord, but now it represents forgiveness. Amen. Like, Lord, you forgave me. I forgive you, Stephen Tyler. <laughs> now, I am not yet translated into a into a holy body and <laughs> into, into perfection. So I still have ill thoughts of him sometimes. But the Bible says where that kind of thought and that kind of stuff abounds, the grace of our Lord doth much more about us. I said, Lord, give me grace. Amen. Give me grace. Give me grace. Amen. <laughs> what do you have that you're keeping back from the Lord? You see, he could have said, no, 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 not the boat. Stay on the shore. I'll listen to you, but stay on the shore. Not the boat. But God took it further. <laughs> I love that the Lord does that because there are many things that I've said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to be around that anymore. And I haven't. And God, and, and one would think, okay, is that enough? And God says, no. You see, parents today a lot of times think, well, I love you so much. I don't want to change you. I just want you to be creative. And I don't want to tell you no about anything because I love you so much. And God says, that's not love. Amen. Love says, I want to make you better. And that's what God does. He says, I'm not just satisfied with how far you've come. He said, but there's a closer walk with me. Hallelujah. There, there's, there's a deeper relationship with me. There's, a, there's an intimacy with me that you've got to have. Because you don't know the blessings I want to pour on you. All you see of love is, is what's in Hollywood and what's in magazines and on movies. He said, but my love goes beyond that. My care for you goes beyond that. It's more than you ever thought. It's better than you've ever heard. He said, I love you. I love you. Would you please have that relationship yeah, with me? Yeah, thank you, Lord. You see, this is what God wants. He wanted that with Peter, somebody that people would be like, oh, it's good he's a fisherman. Because a fish, you know, they can't hear him. They can't hear how he talks. They don't know how brash he is. It's a good thing he's out there. 
and not back here with society. It's a good thing he's not in public service. You ever thought about that? <laughs> Peter, he would have been a bad drive through person. He would, have, <laughs> he would have been a bad teller at the bank. Can I get an amen? amen. He, he wouldn't have been very good for that. <laughs> and no doubt people thought that. They're like, good thing he's not selling the fish at the market, huh? He's just going out and catching them. <laughs> God knows our weaknesses. And God saw through Peter's faults and he saw his need and he loved him. He loved him. Amen. What are you holding back from God that's keeping God from loving you as much as he wants to love you? Amen. Our will, our pride, our wants. Sometimes it's chasing after things and sometimes it's chasing after people and sometimes it's chasing after an experience and it's chasing after whatever it is that Satan puts in front of us. And God's got the answer. He says, seek me first and all these things will be added unto you. And we get it wrong. We seek all these things. And we say, okay, God, now I want some of you. And God says, no, you get all of me and you'll get all these things. Right. And we get it backwards. The Bible says in verse number four. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. <laughs> Number one was allow Jesus to take control. Number two was do what Jesus asked you to do. Yeah. You know, these are real simple. These, these, aren't, these aren't some, you know, philosophical discussions that guys with big white beards and, and, and man skirts, big robes and everything like that have spent years discussing. These are real simple things. Let God take control and do what he tells you to do. Amen. I read verse 4. Jesus was the son of Joseph. What was Joseph's profession? What did he do? Carpenter. He was a carpenter. In other words, he worked with wood and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus, and, and what happens is, Jesus being the son of a carpenter would normally take the profession of his father. That, that, that trade would be handed down. So that's why Jesus is called a carpenter a lot of times. Jesus, a carpenter, is now telling a career fisherman, hey, let's go. And I want you to go fishing. Now, the Bible tells us that Peter, James, John, all these guys, they had just been fishing all night long and had caught nothing. Can you say nothing? Nothing, nothing means nothing. nothing. <laughs> See, we're catching on to that. My goodness. So they toiled all night. They're stinking. They're hot. They're sweaty. They're, fine. they're finishing up, mending their nets so they can pile them up, turn their boats over, dock them, and go home. They got to tell their families, we didn't catch anything today. It's going to be uh, slim pickings for food tonight. Don't have any money. Don't have anything coming in today. And this Jesus comes in, and before they can get their nets back in the boat, turn it over and protect them from whatever, Jesus climbs in the boat and says, hey, cast down a little bit. You ever get to that point where you're like, just whatever? Anybody ever get that way? Where you just, whatever. You know, you're disgusted, you're frustrated. And you're irritated so much that you don't even have anything to say. You just, that's it. It's like, whatever, can't get any worse. <laughs> so that's exactly what Peter's feeling today. And Jesus says, cast out. As a matter of fact, the carpenter says, cast out. This guy that's not even in our profession says, cast out into the deep and get ready to receive some fish. Whatever. All right. Now watch this, watch this. <laughs> Jesus told Peter where to fish, when to fish, and how to fish. The carpenter, that's like me going up to Buzz Aldrin and being like, all right, here's what we're going to do about snakes. <laughs> here's what we're going to do. We're this here ship, want you to press the buttons, do something, pull some levers, and we're going to go up there, we're going to... Do whatever we do in space when we come back. That's it. Yeah, that's about the extent of my knowledge about space right there. It looks like this, and we do things like that. You float around. That sounds about right. That's about what they thought about Jesus' experience with fishing. 
That's, I mean, I enjoy eating, and therefore, I'm an expert in fishing, because I like eating fish, right? Does it work like that? So, Jesus looks at it and tells them where to fish, how to fish, and when to fish. You know, there's a saying, I know it's in the military, and I don't know if it's a lot of other places, and you hear it a lot, it's called, stay in your lane. And when somebody gets out, each, each person in the military has an MOS. And when somebody gets out of their MOS and starts talking about something they don't know about, a lot of times that person will be like, hey man, stay in your lane. I've got this. Because they're an expert in that field. We have what they call warrant officers. And a warrant officer is an expert in his field. And a warrant officer, even though a second lieutenant outranks a, a warrant officer five, a warrant officer, even a warrant officer one, can halt an entire operation because he's an expert in the field. He says, no, we're not doing this. Why? Why does he have the authority? Because he's an expert in the field. I've heard a warrant officer tell a commander before, uh, no, sir, we're not going to do that. No, we have to do this. This is the mission. And the warrant officer looked at the commander and said, sir, with all due respect, you need to stay in your lane in this one. It's not going to happen like that because of this, 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 and this. And there's nothing the commander can do about it except for stay in his lane. Jesus tells professional fishermen where, when, and how to fish. And I can almost guarantee you somewhere in Peter, James, or John's head, it popped in their head, you need to stay in your lane. <laughs> I'm the professional fisherman here. You're not going <laughs> to... I can just imagine anybody like who wants deadliest catch when they're doing the crab fish and stuff. I can just imagine myself walking onto the boat. All right, here's what we're going to do. Here's the way things are going to go. We're going to throw some of these cages over, and we're going to pull up some crab we're going to eat. Because I don't care about selling them. All I am, I'm hungry. Can I get me a man? Anybody hungry here this morning? All right, maybe just me. Whatever. Let's go on. Stay in your lane. Peter probably had some of these thoughts. He thought, I tried all night. Uh, I'm the professional. And there's no use. I know what's going to happen because I've just come from there and I failed. Oh my. Let's think about this spiritually. How many times have we told the Lord the same thing? God, I've been there before. Now, I've been here spiritually before. I know what's going to go on here. I'm going to fail again. I'm going to mess up again. And because of our view of ourselves, because of our past, and our ill reliance on God, we have a terrible outlook to the future. Amen. And we think, oh, I'm just going to fail again. I'm just going to fail again. Amen. Anybody ever feel like that? Amen. Understand this. There's one subject matter expert on everything, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's his lane, whatever lane it is. And whatever he tells you to do, he is the expert in whatever it is. Amen. And he knows what you can handle. He knows what you can do. And he will not tell you to do something if he would not equip you to do that. Amen. Oh, give him praise this morning, church. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. Amen. He knew what to do. He knew what his response would be. Peter's response. And Simon answering said unto him, verse 5, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, whatever, at your word, I will let down the net. Anybody ever handle God's commands like that? I do. I feel the urge to call somebody or text somebody or go see somebody. I'm like, Oh, Lord. Really? And I'll try to make excuses and stuff like that, but you feel that calling, and it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And let me tell you what happens. Ten times out of ten, I get the blessing when I just follow God's will because we always pray, God bless this, God bless that, God bless the other, and God says, my will is already blessed. If you'll get in my will, you'll be blessed. Amen. And we say, God bless this and bless that, and God says, my will is blessed. Get in my will and you'll be blessed. Amen. And so I have to humble myself and say, God, you're the subject matter expert. If you're sending me here, you have a reason for it. Amen. Nevertheless, I'm going to let down the net. It's easy to call ourselves Christians, but it's harder to act like one. Amen. Mm. The Bible says in John 8, 31 and 32, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
The whole point of that is continuing God's word. Not trust God for the things that are easy, but trust God for everything. Amen. There are people in our society that are looking for love. They're looking for companionship. They're looking for peace in their lives. And they will never, ever find it until they find Jesus. Amen. And understand this. People that hear God's word, people that hear the teaching of God's word, hear it on the radio, have heard this preacher and many other preachers preach God's word saying, hey, listen, this is God's will and God's word that you have love and peace and hope and joy if you just seek him first. And so many people will still go about their business seeking it from a person, a place or a thing and will totally ignore the subject matter expert in everything. Right. Talk to me. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. We have to keep living in God's word. John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yeah. You see, Peter did something that we don't do a lot of times. He did what God told him to do. Understand this. It was the same lake. It was the same boat. It was the same person. It was the same nets. Except this time, he was listening to Jesus. You may have been a failure in the past. And you may be starting to go through the same thing. But understand this. If you follow Jesus Christ, you may be the same person in the same situation, facing the same problems. But at the command of Jesus, let me tell you what happens. Blessings instead of cursing. Hallelujah. Amen. Prosperity instead of damnation. Talk to me, church. Amen. Happiness instead of sadness. Joy instead of mourning. That's the difference of a master's touch. That's the difference of what God can do in our lives. That's what God wants to do today. Share the blessings. Watch this. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, that they began to sink. Understand this. When God blessed them, because of their obedience, when God blessed them, they had to call to their partners and say, Look, God's blessing us. We want to bless you. Who are we when God blesses us and God gives us peace and hope and love and joy? When God makes a good ending out of a bad beginning, talk to me. Who are we to keep that into ourselves Amen. rather than to tell somebody about it? Come on. Hey, we've got a perfect excuse. Merry Christmas. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus Christ came to this world. We've got a perfect reason. We've got a perfect segue into any conversation. Jesus came to this earth to spread peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Amen. People are looking for that worldwide. Yeah. We have him. He is in our hearts. Amen. Who are we not to spread that joy, that happiness, that peace, and that love? But first we must get perspective. Listen to this. Verses number 8 and 9. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Notice he had already been talking to Jesus. He had talked to Jesus in the boat. He had seen Jesus. He had plenty of time to fall down before that. Why now? Because he saw what Jesus did. He had perspective on who Jesus was. You see, a lot of times we don't do what God tells us to do because we don't have perspective. All we think is that we are encased in this problem, in this situation, and our vision goes only to the problem because we look here and here. But if we will just look up, come on, talk to me, in the middle of our situations, in the middle of our problems, he said, listen, get perspective. I am the Lord of all or I'm not Lord at all. Either you believe in me or you do not. And if you believe in me, you will do my commandments. And if you seek me first, all of these things will be added unto you. That's a promise from the Lord. Lord, let's give him praise. praise Hallelujah. He got perspective, and as soon as he saw God for who he was, he fell down and he said, God, I'm a sinful man. Depart from me. He said, I can't even stand to be around you. I'm so sinful. I'm terrible. Oh, Lord. For he was astonished, and all who were with him at the drought of the fishes which he had taken. I want you to notice something else here. God came to where he was. 
If he were a carpenter, God would have showed him something amazing in carpentry. He was a fisherman, so God showed him the amazing things that he could do right where he was. I don't know your problems, but I know this, God does. I don't know what you're going through, but I know this, God does. And he'll come right into your situation, and he will make all things new. Talk to me. Amen. Because when you look in the mirror, look what God has already done. Look what God has already done with you. How many of you people thought when you were growing up, that there's no way you'd make it to adulthood. <laughs> that person's going to be dead. <laughs> Somebody's going to kill him. <laughs> look what God has done. Amen. Amen. He's made us sit together in heavenly places with one another. Finally, reset your priorities. Verse number 10 says this. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth you shall catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. With every head bowed and every eye closed. After all of this, they reset their priorities. See, their priorities were just to catch fish. But they didn't have perspective. And they didn't have God. So what are your priorities today? What's your perspective on God? They reset their priorities. And they said, I've got to forsake all and follow him. And because they did that, these are the founders. These are our forefathers that preached the gospel and started churches, started ministries for God. And the words that they spoke still echo today in 2016 on this Sunday morning in Hot Springs, North Carolina. We're talking about James and John. <laughs> And Peter, why? Because they forsook all. Now, to some, the words that I've spoken this morning, the words that have come from God's holy word, are just going to go over your head. And you're going to keep on doing the things that you want to do. There's nothing I can do about that. That's between you and the Lord. But I will not be guilty for not telling you the truth. And the truth is, there's going to come a time. When you can't answer questions. When you don't have it all figured out. When friends will forsake you. 